So I don't know if you've ever done it, but you kind of sit here for a minute and let your back breathe for a second. And then you just hang. But if you hang completely upside down, there's so much pressure on your ankles and so much blood in your head, it gives me a headache. So this is about the right amount of slope. There's another type of exposure uh, that we face after being in the cath lab. And it's not just the radiation exposure, but it's wearing these lead aprons. Remember, the, the lead aprons are about 30 pounds. When you think uh, about doing thousands of procedures over many, many years, that lead apron starts to take a toll from an orthopedic standpoint. Knee injury, hip injury, back injury. My name is Bob Foster. I'm an interventional cardiologist from Birmingham, Alabama. I've been an interventional cardiologist about 30 years. I've probably done uh, 12 to 15,000 procedures. Even early on in my practice, doing very long cases, I felt the orthopedic strain of wearing lead apron. I was, I was very active doing, you know, running long distances, doing triathlons. That was my passion. I love to be, uh, love to be active and love to run. And then after about 15 years of doing these procedures, I ruptured my first disc. And the orthopedic surgeon told me at that time that that a lot of it was because of the lead apron that I was wearing and just wearing that weight day in and day out is putting too much pressure on my spine. Well, the, the idea with wearing lead is it's just extra stress being put on the back and the spine. And so with cardiologists in particular, they, they have to wear those protective uh, clothes. It's like being a fireman. They have to wear you know, 80 pounds of gear to go into a burning house. Well, sometimes it gets to where you can't do that physically. Th this is just a model of, of what a ruptured disc looks like and, and how we're built. The bones sit uh, like a fish backbone or stack in aluminum cans, one on top of the other. And the disc is the cartilage of the spine in between each bone. And then here's where you can see, here's where the individual nerves leave the spine. They'll come out in that little gap or tunnel between the bones. And you see it's right behind where the disc is. So what happens with a ruptured disc, part of it can uh, weaken or break free sometimes. And they'll typically go backwards and it pushes the nerve against the bone and it pinches it. So it's like a rock in your shoe. It doesn't have to be big to hurt really bad. I recovered from that pretty quick. And and probably within just a few months, I went back into the lab. And and just with the, with the passion of taking care of patients, uh, I went back full speed in what I was doing prior to the injury, thinking, okay, it's, you know, the injury has happened. And, uh, and now I'll, you know, maybe reduce my running distances or, or alter, you know, some other portion of my life. But I was not gonna alter what I did every day because I just loved it. And, and at that point was really reaching the peak of my career. With any injury, even though the body can heal it, it probably means that you're a little more likely to have that injury again in the future. So it is something to have to keep in the back of your mind and it becomes a weighing the odds there. You know, what's the risk benefit of this and uh, the likelihood of things happening again. So then my disc ruptured again. And the second time it ruptured was, was devastating for me. My right leg was paralyzed. Uh, I couldn't walk for over a month. Um, and during that time, it, it was a time of reflection of, of this is going to end my career. But it's also, more importantly, and I think more emotional for me, is I started thinking about my, my kids and my grandkids and, and what's life going to be like going forward when you have a paralyzed leg. And, and all the things that you think and dream that you want to do in the future, and particularly actively as you're still working, but also uh, also after you retire. And all those dreams were shattered. All right, are you gonna squeeze this in? Yeah. I'll tell you when that's enough. Oh. 
Oh. <laughs> so when he was down the first time, it was not as hard of a healing process. And then the second time was a, a more severe acute issue, but the healing part was years mm -hmm. and probably still going on today. There's um, been things that we no longer do that we both enjoyed. And if I can still do things that I know he enjoyed, I feel bad if I'm doing them, you know, with him watching me experience that. But, um, and you know, just the emotional setbacks of a physical injury due to your occupation is hard for anybody, but I think for the provider of a family, it's it's tough when they have to step away from something that they love, that they've trained for, and you know, it's not by choice to have to step away. Yesterday was my last day in the OBL, so you know, no more outpatient procedures. Just went through all these last mile stuff, yeah. you know, after 30 something years. I uh, was able to recover and be able to walk again. I stayed out of the cath lab completely for a year. But the problem is the pain doesn't go away. And, and they said the next one is going to be you know, rods and plates and, and, you know, really big surgery. And, and I don't want that. I want to stay healthy. So. Uh, the reason that I'm stepping away from full-time cardiology because I have been all of my life, my focus has been on patient care, and rightly so. That's why we signed the Hippocratic Oath. But it's been at the expense of, of our own health. And so what I want to do is turn my focus from patient care to those who are taking care of those patients. These people work in the lab that are saving these lives every day, they're doing wonderful things, but it takes people. And these people have lives, and these people have families, and these people have a future and have dreams that when they get through with their occupation, when they say, I have given my life and my passion to taking care of other people, but, uh, but now that passion has damaged my body to the point that now I can't even enjoy the fruits of the labor, then, then I think that's a really problem. And I think we see that in our, our jobs. I think it's his God-given gift to care and treat people. And he, he loves that, it's his gift. So I do worry that he's gonna miss patient care, but I do know he's stepping away for something that's for the greater good. So now I'm going to focus on those caretakers and, and make it so that they're safe in the environments so that they, keep in, they can keep on going, taking care of patients. And ultimately, I think indirectly, even though it won't be in my hands, it'll be in their hands, that they're more protected. They can practice longer and they can save more lives. The majority of interventional cardiologists end up with um, basically a damaged spine. I've had one knee replacement, I'm waiting for a hip, I'm getting another knee done and I got my lower back. I was 42, I was running to try to stay you know, in shape and uh, I had this horrible crushing pain in my back and uh, I couldn't, couldn't go anywhere, I had to lay down on the ground and then had my wife come and pick me up and take me home and I had a ruptured L3, L4 disc and I lay flat on my back and as I was laying flat on my back, I got a call from the hospital that one of my patients had had a cardiac arrest. And I had to like, you know, get off of, the bed, off of the floor and go into the hospital, hardly able to move, putting on lead and just killing myself to try to resuscitate the patient. I was flying back and laid like this. And then the next morning- Where were you flying back from? from well, I was flying back from Switzerland, but uh, <laughs> you know, fell asleep. And you know, if you do this, it, crimps that nerve, and yeah. once that nerve swells up, I woke up at a weak hand and a numb hand. And uh, even worse for an interventionist that I couldn't move my leg when I blew out my back. You know, being in that lead all day, we don't have the greatest posture when we're sort of bending over the table, all these things that put enormous uh, pressure on your spine. And, uh, you know, I'm absolutely convinced that's, that's just 
part of the price we pay for having to wear lead when we're doing our job. I've been lucky that I've you know, remained functional and, and can really do what I want to do, but many of my colleagues that I know, that is not the case. I one time saw a, a survey of cath lab personnel who've been working in the lab for over 10 years, and half of them have already sustained orthopedic problems to the knees, hips, and back. So I have the low back pain, like everyone, the spasm. Um, the, uh, the unique thing for most physicians that work in our field, they have what we call a tilted hip. And uh, the reason the hip is tilted, uh, the weight of the lead and you rotate to work um, creates a hip that is tilted. The right leg, if they're right-handed, or the left leg, if they're left-handed, is shorter than the other leg. And you don't know that until you go to do physical therapy and you see that yourself and you freak out. Then you do the physical therapy and you correct it. Now, if you don't correct it and you leave it, then you end up having a problem. And uh, there's a young partner of mine who actually, um, 46, I think, or 47, uh, already have had back surgery. Hi, my name is uh, Fadi Saab. I'm an interventional cardiologist. When I had my herniated disc, I was in significant pain, significant discomfort. And, uh, and uh, it's an interesting experience to be the patient, to be on the other side of that, that equation. But none, nonetheless, I tried to conservative approach to kind of, you know, what, what you do in circumstances like this, like pain medications, physical therapy, things of that nature. And in my case, it did not work very well. It did not, it did not yield um, the outcomes that what I was hoping for, which is, you know, no pain and being able to function. Uh, obviously, I was not able to work. I was not able to treat patients. Um, as a physician, you can't help but to feel somewhat guilty that you're not able to, to care for your patients, even though you're not feeling well. I had a sort of a heart-to-heart -heart conversation with myself and, and my doctor and my family. And, and I said, look, you know, you, you have an opportunity here. If you don't take care of yourself, then, then you're not going to be able to, um, you know, what you're passionate about, what you care about, just helping patients, you're not going to be able to do that. I mean, I'm, I'm lucky. I had a herniated disc. I had surgery. I'm, I'm functional again. But, you know, I've heard some of my colleagues that we're not able to operate anymore. There's physicians that, you know, had knee replacements or hip replacements, they're not able to stand. And so the list goes on and on and on. But I, I guess it's a, it's a word of advice to whoever is gonna see this, take care of yourself. Nobody's gonna suffer as much as you or your loved ones. We use a lead apron or a lead barrier that is incomplete that doesn't really adequately protect us, but at the same time sustain orthopedic injury from that insufficient lead barrier. They have a new knee if your knee wears out, or a new hip if your hip wears out, and even a new heart nowadays, they can give you one of those from somebody else. I don't have a new spine. And uh, or new discs even. And it, the, these are things that we're kind of bound by technology at the present. And so some of the approach that we have a lot of times is trying to uh, maintain what we have as best we can, as long as we can, meaning not allow an injury to occur as opposed to trying to correct it once it has occurred. There were two studies that were done, one in 2004 and one in 2014 at one of our major meetings that Dr. Goldstein looked at the risk and the uh, issues that interventional cardiologists were having at that point. And one of the interesting things is that about 30% of those who had been practicing interventional cardiologists for less than five years were already having back problems. I mean, significant back problems where they had to reduce their caseload or take days off already because of back issues. And that's in the people who had just started their practices. If you go out 20 years, 
and you've been practicing the lab for 20 years, those statistics were over 60% were already having limiting and disabling back issues. Flip side of that too, if you look at people who don't do what we do, the risk of a disabling orthopedic uh, issue is like three to 4%. And so you're going from three to 4% if you don't do what we do to over 60% if you do. That's, that's a big jump, it's not a, it's not a subtle figure. And unfortunately, those numbers were collected back in 2004 and 2014, and nothing's changed since then. So it's time for change. It's time for us to put some, put some minds together, put some education together, and not only educate people, but about the risk, but also let's find a solution.